Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, I'm John Hovey. I'm, the, I'm a deputy secretary in FACS. And FACCR is hosting the, this event this morning. Um, and FACCR is one of my areas of responsibility. So we're thrilled to have had the interest uh, this morning that we've had. The, the event filled up uh, within three days. And we've got a waiting list. So we're really, really pleased to see this much, much interest in uh, research in the areas um, where we work. I'm just going to make a few um, comments. But first, of course, I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land. Um, and uh, our el uh, elders past and present and recognize and acknowledge any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, colleagues that we have here today. We'll have a welcome to country in just a moment, but I uh, have a couple opening remarks um, that I'd like to make. Um, so FACSIAR, FACSIAR, well FACS are, are the predecessor to FACSIAR, uh, FACS Analysis and Research, which is now FACS Insights Analysis and Research, uh, was formed in 2012. Uh, to be a specialist organization focusing on research and analysis um, and providing good data, evaluation, and insights into the areas of work um, where FACTS provides services. So child protection, housing, homelessness, and to some degree, uh, domestic and family violence. Um, uh, and we need a strong evidence base, obviously, for, for what we do. And we need to constantly be building a strong evidence um, base for what we do. Uh, and we're in an interesting time in that government, governments um, across all jurisdictions are looking at service delivery models and less and less um, are services being provided directly by government agencies. And um, instead of that, um, we are seeing service delivery models that are very mixed uh, and very complex in terms of the, in the involvement of uh, non-government organizations and uh, other providers. So we welcome N N any NGO um, employees or any of our um, partner organizations who are here today as well. It's very important that we work together um, as those service delivery models change, which they are changing um, rapidly. Um, uh, FACTS has a, a very important research function, as you probably all know. So we have an external research program that was established 18 years ago before FACTSR as an entity um, even existed. And we're currently supporting um, more than 20 projects. Um, with some um, currently in the planning stages as well. And support comes from anything from direct funding or in-kind support, support with data sets, support with <coughs> organizing focus groups, uh, supporting enrollment of clients and um, employees who, who participate um, in studies. So our, our support comes in a variety of forms. Uh, and these studies may be PhD pro um, projects involving individual PhD students, or they could be NH and MRC. Um, large uh, funded projects. Uh, and these studies provide not only a great source of data for us, but they contribute to the, uh, building the research capacity and a greater understanding of the important work um, that we do across FACTS and across um, our NGO partners as well. Um, and today we're hearing from two researchers in involved in research funded studies uh, on how to improve the outcomes um, for children in the child protection system. And you'll hear, hear from these um, in a moment. Uh, Associate Professor uh, Melissa Green, who's the lead researcher with the New South Wales Child Development Study, has been analyzing record linkage data for a number of years. And Associate Professor Stephanie Taplin, who's leading a new study examining prenatal reporting. And then we'll also hear from Dr. Chris Car Crow, and I hope I pronounced that right, Chris. Uh, I, don't, I, can't, I don't know if the G is silent or, or not, uh, who received in-kind support from FACTS to undertake his PhD examining child protection and court documents. So again, thank you all um, for coming. Um, um, the chair for the seminar is Kate Alexander, who, is the, um, who leads the Office of the Senior Practitioner uh, in, in FACTS. And Kate will, Kate will join us as the... Um, as the um, uh, host in, or the chair in a moment. Um, but I'll try to keep my hands, hands, hands off. <laughs> um, Kate has a Master of Social Work uh, degree, has worked in the fields of child protection and child sexual assault for more than 25 years. She was awarded a Churchill Fel Fellowship um, and in that work led to the development of the New South Wales Practice, New South Wales practice First Framework um, and the New South Wales Practice Standards. Kate's undertaking her own PhD research on decision making uh, in child protection, specifically considering practice approaches that make a positive difference to children. So thank you, Kate, for chairing today. So again, thank you all. And I'd now like to welcome 
Um, Yvonne Weldon for other Metropolitan Land Aboriginal Land Council to, uh, for the Welcome to Country. Welcome, Yvonne. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, sisters and brothers. My name is Yvonne Weldon and I am a Radjuri woman originally from Cowra here in New South Wales. I'm from the waters of the Clare, also known as the Lachlan and of the Murrumbidgee Rivers. I'm the elected chairperson of the Metropolitan Lake Aboriginal Land Council, who are a culture authority under the Aboriginal Land Rights Act for the land we're meeting on. I would like to pay re my respects to all elders past and present, and to all First Nations and non-First Nations people here today. We're meeting here on the lands of the Eora Nation. The boundaries of the traditional owners are not defined by hand and by a pen, but through the natural landscapes of the earth. The Eora Nation's country covers the Hawkes River in the north, the Nepean in the west, and the Georges River in the south. My people have practiced our traditions for thousands of years and endless generations. One tradition that is shared in various forms across this country is a welcome to country. As you travel across this beautiful country of ours, understand you're entering the lands of a nation, a tribe and a clan, which has existed for over 60,000 years. The First Nations of this land are from the oldest living culture of the world. Our practices and our traditions have sustained us and they are embedded into the core of this nation. On behalf of the Metropolitan Lake Labrador Land Council, the Elders and the members, I welcome everyone to the land of the Wongal and acknowledge the Wongal people whose spirits and ancestors will always remain with this land, our Mother Earth. Let us all recognise the sacrifices that we have made, the ones we will continue to make and the ones we shouldn't have to. There are been many lessons learned at our expense and our devastation. They should and must be acknowledged, not out of a guilt, but to listen, learn, and to come together, to commence a healing and creating a future for all. Let us not live regretting what we should have done, but create the legacy of what must be done. As you connect, learn, and share, today, tomorrow, and beyond, don't lose sight of the important work that still needs to be done, to bring my people, your people, and our people together making real changes, not just symbolic ones. If we are to move forward together, we must do it in partnership equally. And I'll mix this up. All of us can make a positive change for this country now and into the future. To make that future possible, let us all draw upon my people's spirits as we continue on our journey. May my people's spirits walk with you and guide you as we strive forward for us all. Again, on behalf of the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council, welcome to Wonka Land. Always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Thank you and have one for that. I too acknowledge uh, the Wongal people who are the traditional custodians of this land and pay very genuine and heartfelt respect uh, to Elders past, present and future and Aboriginal colleagues with us today. You cannot work in child protection in this country and not have come face to face with the devastating impact of the stolen generations. Yet the Aboriginal families we work with and Aboriginal colleagues who work with them bring so much hope and resilience and courage and humour to our work and they've taught us so much. So thank you. Um, as said before, my name's Kate Alexander and I'm a senior practitioner and I am thrilled to be your MC for today. And again, I'm sorry about us being late, going to the wrong venue. I'd like to welcome you all now and really hope that this morning is an important time for you all to just uh, sit back and take in the wisdom and the learning of such fantastic speakers. We don't get enough time in this work to reflect and to challenge and to think. So this is a wonderful opportunity and thanks to Marina and her team for organising it. I'd like to acknowledge all those who have participated in the fact-supported research, whether directly or via the use of their data, as without them, there is of course no research to help us understand how to do better for children. Also wanted to invite, um, to welcome our invited presenters, our panel members, those joining us from the non-government sector, other New South Wales government agencies. So <laughs> Melissa is a researcher in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of New South Wales. Her research is broadly focused on determining modifiable risk factors for the development of mental disorders using a combination of techniques from cognitive psychology, neuroscience, genetics and epidemiology. With childhood maltreatment among the leading risk factor for a variety of mental disorders, Melissa's research conducted in partnerships with FACTS 
aims to delineate cross-agency predictors of risk of harm and mental health trajectories of maltreated children with an interest in determining risk and resilience mechanisms at key stages of development. You can see that she's an underachiever. You better get up here, <laughs> Melissa. Thank you. So, uh, thank you again for the invitation to be here. I'm really pleased to be able to tell you about the work that we've been doing for the past yeah. eight to ten years now. We're at a critical stage of having our data ready to you know, do some great work with. And um, the project I'm talking about is known as the New South Wales Child Development Study. It was instigated by Professor Vaughan Carr, um, as I say, nearly, nearly 10 years ago now. The, oops, get that right. This paper here presents our profile uh, paper for the first stage of record linkage of the data. The study methods are illustrated here. It's a longitudinal record linkage study of children who uh, were assessed with the early development census in 2009. So um, we started as our first linkage happening in around 2011-12, taking the data from the 2009 cohort of children across the whole state of New South Wales and working backwards to link their data from birth and their parents' data from a range of government departments for as far back as the records were accessible and in, in good shape to be used for this kind of research. So that went back to 1994 in the case of justice records, but around 2000 in the case of health records. Um, our second wave of linkage has just been undertaken in 2016. For most of 2017 we spent time cleaning and linking the data and in 2018 we're finally ready to run the analyses that we'd like to do and really um, have sincere thanks to the Department of Family and Community Services who have worked with us intensively over the last five years and um, put forward a contribution to funding that enabled us to get a partnership project grant from the NHMRC last year and with that funding we are assisting with the Their Futures uh, Matter policy development um, using this cross-agency linked data that is so valuable to those kinds of efforts. So the couple of things I just want you to take away from this slide is that down the bottom there you can see we are bringing together 17 record sets that contain more than 1500 variables as we receive them. That's not even to say the amount of variables we then create from those 1,500 we receive. There are over 3.4 3 million records that we receive and it is absolutely an overwhelming task for our team who are just you know, frantically working as fast as we can to get the data prepared for analyses. So I jumped forward because I, I wanted to show you the methods before I then tell you what, what we're doing. We're interested in childhood trauma um, because it's a significant risk factor for mental disorders and pre-morbid pre childhood psychopathology. Recent worldwide research has told us that there's a threefold increase of, of in, um, developing psychosis after a childhood trauma. And we see the evidence of this in early emotional, social and cognitive functioning. We can see it in the early development census and as, as I'll show you soon. We also know as someone who has delved into brain imaging and genetics, um, kind of leaving that behind with the overwhelming task here and this linked data. Um, but the brain is very rapidly developing in those early years of life. It's very sensitive to stress. Those who have children know about, you know, that the way that you need to read to children and interact with the brain to have it develop in the way that it is supposed to. If a um, young developing brain is subjected to stress over a prolonged period, that can really interfere with the development of systems like the HPA response system, the immune system. Um, for example, toxic cortisol levels can then have downstream effects on brain development. So it really is critical that we find ways to identify children who are at risk of these developing brain disorders as early as possible. And by partnering with family and community services, we can do that as well as our other partners. So I'm going to start off by telling you about some of our published work that we completed with the first record linkage. So as I described, we conduct the study in waves of linkage uh, so that we can keep up with the children as they're developing. Our first linkage ended at the point of the early development census in 2009 and it linked those list of records there that you can see on the side. So most of our work with that first record linkage uses the AEDC as the outcome, the endpoint, and that fits into the outcomes framework um, that has been developed within Family and Community Services. So the first piece of work I wanted to describe to you 
actually used the subdomain data from the early development census. Most people are familiar with the five um, broad domains that are there on the left. And I wanted to just draw your attention that there are 16 subdomains underneath that, um, those five domains that give you a little bit more indication of what parts of the, the domain a child might be uh, struggling within. So this work is published, uh, was published in the Australian New Zealand Journal of Psychiatry last year. That's the paper there if you want further details. And the upshot of the analysis is this. We undertook a latent class analysis of, the, analysis of those 16 subdomains. We were trying to find profiles of children across the whole gamut of the early development census, rather than focusing on a child who might be vulnerable in one domain or another domain. We wanted to see are there patterns of children uh, at risk because they show vulnerability on um, certain patterns of domains. And so here you can see um, along the bottom there are the 16 domains of the uh, subdomains of the AEDC. And you can see a dashed black line and that represents a group of children who are virtually at no risk, um, no showing no vulnerabilities on the AEDC at, when they enter school. You can also see there a group in green that are also showing only very mild generalised risk um, according to their profiles on the AEDC. And then we get to the two interesting classes that represent about 10% of the population. The first one is in blue, we've termed that the misconduct risk group for obvious reasons when you look at the types of vulnerabilities they're showing. They're showing a lack of responsibility and respect when they start school and they're showing aggressive and hyperactive behaviour, suggesting they might be at risk for things like conduct disorders in later life, um, justice system involvement, and um, you won't be surprised to hear that they're predominantly boys. Um, then we have a class in red that we've termed the pervasive risk group. They amount to about 4% of the population, so a very small group, but at extremely high risk of developing mental illness in later life. Um, these, these children show developmental vulnerabilities very highly on uh, social and emotional functioning. And what we did with these four groups then was ask the question as to whether we can determine early risk factors for membership in those groups. And I will always be keeping the colours of the groups the same. So red implies that the child is within the pervasive risk group, blue the misconduct risk and green the mild generalised risk group. And we compared the likelihood of being male of being subjected to childhood maltreatment, of being in a socio-economic disadvantaged population, to the group that have no risk. So that was the majority of the population. What I'm showing here is that the odds of being a member of that pervasive risk group, as you can see, are six times more likely in a child who has received a substantiated maltreatment report. You can see also that the odds of being in the misconduct risk group are four times more likely if you're a male. Now I've shown these three um, risk factors above because I'm about to show a um, sequenced addition of other risk factors and you'll watch the child maltreatment lose its effect as we add in other variables. So first one, I add in parental mental health. So if the child has a parental mental illness, the child has a, a parent with a history of any type of mental illness. You can see that's not very well distinguishing membership of any of the particular groups, but it is showing about twice as likely the odds of being a member of those risk groups, and it has brought the role of the child protection um, exposure down from a six times more likely to around four and a half. And then I add in uh, parental offending, and the childhood maltreatment effect drops slightly again. You can see the effect of being a male child is not dropping um, and that parental mental illness and parental offending are really not too distinct in terms of distinguishing membership of either of the risk classes. Finally, we add in a set of perinatal risk factors that <coughs> there is a massive literature showing that they are relevant to early childhood developmental vulnerabilities. And we see once again that the effect of childhood maltreatment has now dropped down to around two and a half to three times more likely than the other, that the no risk group, and that really none of the other indicators are distinguishing between which risk group a child is in, but that all of them are relevant to being in any of the risk groups. So for us, um, this has taken us some way toward helping to identify children at age five who are at risk of developing mental illness. 
Um, but there's work to do in terms of distinguishing the different types uh, of vulnerability. So that's one set of work that I'll pick up on again at the end of the presentation. I wanted to also touch upon work we did specifically with the childhood maltreatment data that we received in the first linkage. And that was to ask very basic questions about what is the likelihood of childhood vulnerability on the early development census when a child has a substantiated maltreatment report. We were limited to substantiated reports in our first linkage, so that's something to bear in mind when you see these results. Again, we're focusing on the vulnerable children in the AEDC, meaning those in the lowest 10th percentile nationally. What we see is that those children are three to five times more likely uh, when you're using crude, unadjusted regressions. Those children are um, at higher risk of being vulnerable across all of the, the AEDC domains. When we add in the types of variables I just showed you, being male sex or of a low socioeconomic status, um, having a young mother or a mother who smoked during pregnancy, you can see those uh, odds or the likelihood of being vulnerable drop down to about two times, but it's still remaining highly significant. We also looked into whether multiple maltreatments made a difference. And I want to stress here that when a child, as you would probably well know, when a child is receiving reports of multiple maltreatment types, it's very highly correlated with the number of reports that they're actually receiving. So this is really a reflection of severity in terms of how many reports are coming in about a child. And you can see pretty clearly there that children who are receiving multiple types or multiple maltreatment reports um, are showing a significantly higher vulnerability uh, risk in terms of their AEDC outcomes. And finally, we looked at whether the timing of that maltreatment report mattered. And these findings I need to stress now are, they've been published and we need to write the sequel now because we've just now, in our second wave of linkage, actually received all levels of reporting, not just the substantiated reports. And when you look at this graph, it's telling you that actually those children receiving substantiated reports in the later periods before five years of age, so after 18 months, it's suggesting that they're the ones who are at a higher risk of vulnerability on the AEDC. Um, I haven't brought the data here, but what we now see with all of the reports included is the exact opposite and what we actually thought would happen here. So it's pleasing that what we thought was true is true, uh, but not as pleasing that we've published this and now need to fix the literature to say, uh -uh, not correct. Um, really it is those children who are receiving the port reports earlier, no matter what type of report, a non-ROSH or a, a ROSH that hasn't been checked or substantiated yet, they are the children at higher risk of the vulnerability at age five. So bear that in mind and it's a lesson to make sure you've got all your data to hand before you start making claims about things. So how important is this result with the AEDC? Just wanted to stop and, and remember that these these developmental vulnerabilities are the, um, and developmental competencies really that are assessed by the AEDC are the building blocks for later development. They're, they're relevant for social cognitive skills, relationship building, vocational achievement, and the early signs of their vulnerability uh, are clearly relevant and known antecedents to later mental disorders. So again, we are really trying to get in and help identify these children early and we are already seeing high rates of mental illness even up to age 13 years in these children and I will show you some of those results shortly. So from here on in I'm now going to talk about the next wave of linkage where we just received data from all levels of child protection reporting up to age 13 years for these children. We now also have mental health ambulatory data for these children that we didn't have before. We also have NAPLAN assessments that we didn't have before because they hadn't reached that age yet. And we also undertook our own survey of mental health and well-being uh, through schools when the children were about age 11 and 12. That was no mean feat because we did not have government support the way that the AEDC does to buy out teach time and, and have the students complete the, the survey in class. But we did it and we achieved about a third of the state population it is representative of the rest of the population, so we do have a fair bit of data to work with in terms of our own self-reported mental health problems, because obviously the ones that are going to hit the health system are much more severe, and we're going to miss some of the vulnerability without having a questionnaire like this at that age. 
It meant that our next wave of, of linkage is a bit of a messier cohort. It's not just defined by the AEDC inclusion anymore. Some children were in year six and did our survey and they weren't present in the AEDC in the state at the first wave of our linkage. So we have this overlap now of students who completed the MCS, our middle childhood survey, students who completed the AEDC, a crossover of about 23,000 who did both and a total cohort now of 91,635 children. So with that data, this is the demographics. We've got most children aged around 13 years, a very good distribution of sex, um, about six, uh, just over 6,000 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders in the state population and over 20,000 children whose language background is something other than English, so sometimes the, the first language of the, the parents. It's not to say the children are not learning English as their first language, but the family language is something other than English. Okay, so all of that and the work that we did with um, our FAXIAR representatives over the years did benefit both of our groups and to the point that we have achieved this partnership project funding with the NHMRC and the point of that work is to try to identify cross-agency indicators of high-risk ROSH reports and to inform those improvements in the current re reform um, of the whole of service um, framework. We're also trying to determine health and wellbeing outcomes of children who are coming into contact with family and community services early in life and we're also determining health cost estimates for these children compared to the rest of the population. So to close, the policy and practice implications are, are pretty clear to us that the cross-agency data linkages are necessary to assist the government to do the work that they are trying to do. It's great to see the government's uh, agencies working together and that the other work we're doing with health is even showing that there are, there's a lot of factors that we can pick up at the child's birth and that will be a captive sort of audience, a place where health can say to the mother at the child's birth, we can offer you this assistance, here's what we can do for you before it gets to the point that family and community services are called when the child's five or, or whatever. So again to reiterate, the earliest detection of these risk factors is crucial for your work and also for our work in trying to uh, thwart what would be a poor mental health trajectory across the life course that's then going to have ramifications for other education, vocational and other social outcomes. So I'm very thrilled to be working with FACS. Thank you Maren Butler especially and Marilyn Chilvers, um, Jessica Stewart for all of the, the me meetings that we have to get this work done together. The people listed there on the left are the team that are just working so hard and I wouldn't be here without them. So thank you again for your attention and for inviting me here today to present this work. Thank you, Melissa. Boy, Stephanie and Chris, I bet you're regretting that they let her speak first. Um, uh, what a powerhouse, because in 20 minutes to cover such rich data in such an accessible way uh, was fantastic. As we as a department grapple with decisions about lines of demarcations we draw around non-ROSH, ROSH substantiation, I mean, that's all a system we built around managing reports. Uh, information like yours is so incredibly powerful, so thank you. I, I'm now going to introduce our second speaker, uh, Associate Professor Stephanie Taplin, and uh, really looking forward to this research because Stephanie's work is about the removals of infants by the child protection system, examining their nature, extent and impact to guide prevention and early intervention. <laughs> Um, as I said, Stephanie's Associate Director, she works at the Institute of Child Protection Studies at the Australian Catholic University. Stephanie has spent much of her career in the alcohol and other drugs field and has more recently focused on the intersection between alcohol and other drugs and child protection. Stephanie has just commenced a new ARC funded study in co collaboration with national and international researchers examining the nature, extent and impacts of prenatal recording. Reporting. She's also conducting the K contact study, a randomised control trial of contact for children in out of home care in New South Wales, ACT, and Victoria, which concludes later this year. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners, uh, custodians of the land on which we meet, and make, uh, um, pay my respects to their elders, past and present. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, some of the work that um, I've been doing 
with others around prenatal reporting, um, infant involvement with the child protection system and infant entries into care. So it follows on quite nicely from Melissa's um, talk about um, needing to intervene early. So some of the data I'll be talking about um, draws on projects I've done after, over the last few years and some of the broader literature and a little, little bit about what I will be doing over the next couple of years. So I became interested in the issue of um, looking at infant removals um, during the course of my postdoctoral work that I did. It was funded by FACS. Um, I interviewed an, a large number of illicit drug using mothers, many of whom um, had lost babies at birth to the child protection system and many of them had lost several babies. So these mothers were quite distressed um, and it begged the question um, about how, how are the infants doing. Um, and then I found that we didn't really have that much information about uh, what happens with those infants and so that has led to this study. Um, so um, my collaborators and I, uh, so Melissa O'Donnell and Rhonda Marriott in Western Australia, um, Professor Karen Broadhurst in the UK and uh, Dr Fred Walsh from the USA, we applied for and were successful in getting some Australian Research Council funding for a three year study looking at infant removals and prenatal reporting and we're just starting that now. Um, so the main questions we're hoping to answer are about the extent, nature and impacts of infant remo removals um, and we hope that that will also have a big um, impact um, and inform policy and practice. Um, so we're using, using fax data um, in New South Wales. The study is also being done in uh, Western Australia doing a, so using the same methodology. We're looking at case files and we're doing interviews with a small number of uh, families who, where a newborn has just been removed. So a lot of it's about the decision making. Um, and we've got input from our um, overseas collaborators as well who've done work and are continuing to do work in this area. Um, so because we haven't got data yet, I'll just run you through some of the existing data um, just to give you a little bit of a picture of, of where we're starting. Um, so firstly looking at national trends, we know that the number of children in out of home care and the rates of children in care are increasing. Children are entering the care system earlier and staying longer and you will know that New South Wales has 37% of the total out of home care population at the moment. Um, so that's 2016-17 uh, data from the AHW that came out last week. Um, when we look at the number of um, infants admitted to out-of-home care, uh, so in their first year of life, um, the number has remained relatively stable, just over 2,000 nationally, although it was a little bit higher in 2015-16. But the patterns are changing somewhat. Um, so the most recent data that I have is for, at the moment, is for 2014-15. Um, which shows that just over um, of the around 2,000 infants that were um, removed, 548 were removed within their first week of birth, and 954 within a month of their birth. So that's around half uh, removed within a month. Um, and these early removals seem to be increasing. There's another a study that came out last year um, by Christine Marsh who found a steady increase in the number of newborns, um, so aged less than a week old, who entered care in New South Wales over their, their 12 year study period. Um, so the likelihood of a newborn entering care is increasing. Now Australia's not alone in this. Um, similar patterns of increases in early infant removals have been found in the USA and, and um, England um, and we're writing a comparative paper on that at the moment um, but in England that's, that has prompted a whole lot of new service responses to um, intervene with women who've had multiple removals and um, to prevent with the aim of preventing further removals and that's uh, around uh, Karen Broadhurst's work. Um, so to look at it another way, the, um, this shows the trends in the infants as a proportion of the out-of-home care entries 
and this is um, under one year olds, and that has increased. So we've got now got um, from 16.5% of the in, uh, children entering care in 2007, eight, it's now 19.4%. Um, so whether this is an, uh, you know, a reflection of policy changes and in, increased emphasis on the early years, um, it, it may well be. Um, by jurisdiction, uh, we can see that New South Wales um, has the second highest rate of infant removals after South Australia, so it's 23.1% in New South Wales and the national proportion is 19.4%. Um, if we look at it by Aboriginal, um, the number of Aboriginal infant removals, um, the picture is a little bit shocking. Um, infants are being removed at 10 times the rate of non-Aboriginal non um, infants. With my colleagues in Western Australia, so Melissa O'Donnell and Rhonda Marriott, um, we're looking at some Western Australian data uh, which shows that the high rates of um, infant removals and high, shows there are high rates in remote populations, the remote Aboriginal populations in particular, and that's also supported in the AIHW data. So that's just to give you a picture of what the, the where we're starting um, with the overview um, around infant removals. And so um, just thinking a little bit about some of the policy reasons, the, um, why this might be happening. Um, we know that there have been recent calls for um, intervening early um, and that's in response to some of the um, new research on early brain development. Um, and policy and legislative changes have been enacted across Australia to um, bring in prenatal reporting, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, adoption has been promote, proposed and promoted, particularly in New South Wales, as providing a permanent and safe home for life for these children. Um, but we also need to remember that uh, removing a new baby from their parents is a very high level of intervention, the highest used by the child protection system, which causes distress to families and parents. So we need to be sure that it does improve outcomes for the children and the newborns and that they do have a safe family for life. Um, so just a little bit about prenatal reporting. Um, it's a relatively new uh, policy, mostly introduced in jurisdictions since around 2005, um, arising from high profile child protection and child death reviews and the um, increased emphasis on early brain development. Um, and also, uh, I suspect to some extent, um, the discussions around alcohol, the impacts of alcohol use and the, um, on the developing brain and FAS and FASD. Um, and, because, and of course, infants, particularly newborns, are particularly vulnerable because of their dependency on the caregiver, so we need to be really careful. Um, so technically, a child protection report is um, even when the it, it is made about the baby once once born, not the mother. But in practice, it is the situation and the characteristics of the pregnant woman that usually le leads to a prenatal report. And the re the aim of prenatal reporting. Um, reporting during pregnancy is to work with the pregnant woman to reduce the risky behaviours that may impact on the foetus or the newborn and either prevent the need for removal or to identify the need for early removal. So this is just um, some of the, uh, a couple of examples of the wording in the legislation. Um, I particularly note the use of the term unborn child and people talk about the unborn. Um, prenatal reporting is voluntary. It usually includes the word may, um, so it's not mandatory, as you will know. And the level of reporting vary, varies, um, and uh, you will know all about that. Um, 
sometimes um, prenatal and reports, uh, prenatal birth alerts will be put in place. So when the um, uh, with the hospital, so when the baby is born, they will uh, notify facts who um, may have already made a decision, um, which may or may not have been conveyed to the mother. So these data um, show trends in prenatal reports um, by jurisdiction. So it shows an increasing number of um, unborn children in substantiations of notifications, um, particularly in New South Wales, which accounts for the bulk of the reports. Um, in 2016-17, 51% of sub substantiated prenatal reports for, were um, in, for, in relation to Indigenous families. Um, some of the data I've analysed from 2012-13 shows that approximately four in every 100 women were reported um, to child protection during their pregnancy, and that's New South Wales and ACT data. Um, so I did some work with some ACT data, looking at um, using their administrative data, and this was done uh, using 2012-13 data, um, and this has been published in a, it was published in a paper last year. We found that the women who were reported in pregnancy tended to be young mothers who were disadvantaged, um, Aboriginal, had more uh, greater numbers of children, many of whom had been had children removed previously, although a third were having um, their third ba their first baby. Um, these women were reported relatively late in their pregnancy, not leaving much time to address the concerns that brought them to the attention of the child protection system before birth. And they were generally reported by um, the health system, the maternity ward, um, and no doubt in relation to um, uh, yeah, things that had come up during their antenatal assessments. The main reasons for prenatal reports um, in the ACT were around future risk concerns, which is not specific, um, obviously. And the, um, interestingly, parental substance use did not feature particularly highly. I just have to take it too much. <laughs> Um, and the responses, around two-thirds of the women were provided with some support during pregnancy, generally for around four months, and it ended, that support ended at the um, birth or soon after. It may have translated into another type of um, service or support, but this is the way it's reported in the data. Um, lots of referrals were made, and often that was for housing support. 12% of the um, numbers that I looked at, so 14 um, babies, 14 of the prenatal reports resulted in the removal of a baby within the first 100 days of their birth. Five were removed within one week. Um, and when we looked at this all a bit more closely, women who were reported more often during their pregnancy got more supports, but they were also more likely to have their um, baby removed. Um, now, just because I have a particular interest in substance use, I'm just going to talk about this a little bit. Um, so, just to give a bit of context again, um, around the, the extent of substance use during pregnancy, um, we know that tobacco and alcohol are the most commonly used substances during pregnancy. About 12% of women smoke and a third to half of all women report some alcohol use during pregnancy, um, not necessarily risky alcohol use. Illicit drug use by pregnant women has been identified in about, um, in less than 2% of pregnancies. Um, so we've seen from our data that there's, uh, the data that I've just shown you, that um, a lot of the reports come from hospitals, maternity wards, about future risk concerns, not specifically drug and alcohol use. But there's also, a, at the same time um, as 
in relation to prenatal reporting, there's an increased emphasis on screening for substance use in pregnancy, and that's arising out of concerns for um, the impacts of it on parenting and the risks of child maltreatment. Child maltreatment. Um, and that's um, partly related to the, um, as I've talked about, the, the emphasis of alcohol use on the, and the impact on the developing brain. So screening is a way of flagging that there may be problems that need further assessment or treatment, so it's different from, from reporting. It's done by antenatal care providers, but these antenatal care providers um, now also have a role in reporting to child protection about the ability of mothers and their partners to parent once their babies are born and the subsequent safety of the baby. So this creates some tensions. Um, there's professional and ethical tension between risk management approach for child protection um, with the focus on the safety of the child and the health system's focus on the health of the mother and the healthy development of the fetus. Um, and there are other issues that arise like the um, women's presentation and ongoing engagement with services. Um, we need to bear in mind that if women are fearful of being reported to child protection, that they are less likely to attend services. And we know from some previous work that those with certainly illicit drug using women present very late to antenatal services and that increases the risks even further. We hope that both screening and reporting will lead to more in treatment services supports and that these will con be coordinated and work together but we know that doesn't always happen and sometimes there aren't treatment um, places available. Um, and I just also wanted to mention about the evidence on the impacts of um, substances in pregnancy. <coughs> so we know that drug exposed pregnant women experience a number of um, obstetric complications and that children with prenatal substance exposure increase risk for premature birth, low birth weight, etc. But it's also hard to isolate the effects of one substance and there are highly likely to be co-occurring factors related to adverse pregnancy outcomes in substance using populations such as poor nutrition and stress. And we know more about the impacts of stress on the developing <coughs> fetus. But there's also fewer, few long-term effects um, that have been found on developing fetus from illicit substances. Alcohol use is the big worry. So this raises the question um, about identifying and reporting pregnant illicit drug users. Maybe we're moving away that, from that now, that focus. It seems to be um, becoming more recognised. Are we concerned about their parenting? <coughs> Are we concerned about the healthy development of the fetus or the health of the mother? Um, what about providing services to the mother and child? And, and we have to be careful that it's not about moral judgments, that we're um, focusing more on illicit substances when it may be um, they have less impact than, than others. Um, how am I going for time? Um, so, to pull all this together, um, we know that there's lots of um, recording, reporting, assessing and increased removals of babies going on around Australia and it looks like this is, this is increasing. But once, um, once a baby is removed from their mother's care, um, Karen Broadhurst and some of her group in the UK have uh, identified that there is a policy gap and a lack of mandate to provide support to the mothers um, in England, and it seems to be the same in Australia. Um, so there are existing vulnerabilities and fear of further child protection involvement lead these mothers to avoid services and it increases their risks um, and they're not addressed. Having a baby removed is likely to um, increase their distress they will go on a binge, as we know, and all kinds of um, uh, unfortunate things may, may happen, um, and it's not good for anybody. 
But again, make no respect in mistake that having a, a newborn baby removed from your care is a serious sanction. We know that often it's warranted, but we need to look at closely at why we have such high rates of Aboriginal women reported and infants removed. What we're doing for young mothers, and particularly young mothers in out-of-home care who are getting pregnant and having their babies removed. Balancing their, the rights of parents to parent their child against the rights of the child to be safe and well is a complex issue. We all know that, but we need really good evidence about um, what we're doing. Um, we need to look more closely at the impacts of removing babies at such young ages and keeping them in care. Are they getting a safe home for life from the start or are they still getting moved around to multiple placements? Um, there is a serious need for more supports and treatment services for women whose babies have been removed and there have been some nice pilot studies going on in, the, in England such as the PAUSE program um, and there are other um, interventions like the Family Drug Treatment Courts of which there are a lot in the UK and the US. Uh, Victoria has one in one site, ACT is considering a family drug treatment court. I think New South Wales should too. Um, and these interventions and supports um, for these mothers may need to be there for years because their problems aren't going to go away in a few months. Um, and we want to prevent the need for more removals. So, and to sum up, we um, also need to do have better information, um, more research, so we can judge whether and in what circumstances removing a newborn is the best long-term option. So that's all I'm going to say that, about that. And to finish off, I'm just going to do a little plug for the K-Contact study, which is currently underway in New South Wales. Um, some of you may have heard about it. Um, it's a trial of a supervised contact intervention for children in long-term out-of-home care. Um, it's been conducted in um, the ACT in Victoria, um, finished in those jurisdictions. New South Wales FACTS has very nicely provided us with some funding to extend the study into New South Wales. Um, we are finishing data collection. Uh, the intervention is currently being supported in four sites for, uh, well, two sites, two um, randomly selected sites um, in New South Wales, two NGOs. The other two sites who are the comparison groups will be offered um, training and support around the intervention when we're finished. Um, uh, that's probably enough. The, um, we are hoping that the intervention uh, will uh, reduce child distress related contact, improve relationships with children and parents, improve the ability of parents to support children around their contact visits and to reduce the um, proportion of contact visits cancelled. So we expect that it's going to have a big um, impact on the um, evidence base and contact between children in care and their parents because it's very little research in this area and it's a very time consuming and expensive and um, uh, part of the out of home care system about which there is very little evidence. Um, and although we're working with children in long term care and it's mo most of our sample is um, foster care because it would be supervised contact through agencies. Um, if it works, there's no reason it could not be adapted to um, be focused on restoration. Um, that's all I'm going to say. There's a few references there that will be in the um, attachments that you get. And that's all from me. Thank you, Stephanie. Gee, poor Chris, two out of two. <laughs> I, I really want to thank you, Stephanie, on behalf of all of us for uh, such confronting um, 
real and challenging uh, data, but also for bringing the reality of that data to life in a really real way. So, so your language about the highest level of intervention in taking Aboriginal babies from their parents or, or language around serious sanctions. Um, you, you walk that line beautifully between research and uh, respectfully urging us to think about the impact of our practice but with a true appreciation of the context around it. So thank you. Um, last but not least, uh, a subject very dear to our heart, uh, Dr Chris Crow is going to talk to us about language. He's a lecturer at the School of Humanities and Social Sciences at the University of Newcastle. Chris's professional roles include counselling young people and their families, child protection and out-of-home care casework, youth sector development, New South Wales government policy rollout. I was very pleased to read here in this bio that when Chris is tired of uh, research, he's going to come and join us and do some, rip some frontline practice with our young people as well. <laughs> Maybe. The research, um, Chris, Chris's PhD research investigated the effects of documents provided to the New South Wales Children's Court. I mean, this is just such fantastic research. He used document analysis and interviews to respond to the question, what do child protection court documents do to the people closely involved with them? Fantastic. Uh, thank you so much, Chris. Thank you, Kate. Um, and thank you for the welcome, Yvonne. I'm down from Darkenjung land, uh, north of the northern boundary of the Eora land. Um, so thank you and I um, acknowledge uh, leaders and community members and um, past, present and future. Yeah. Um, so as Kate said, I'm um, going to talk about research that was conducted and completed uh, Around early, early uh, 2016 is when it was pretty much completed. Um, it was a piece of qualitative research examining the, question, uh, the effects of child protection court documents have on the people closely involved with them. And I'm going to think about uh, some policy and practice implications. Um, the research started, I guess, even perhaps before I worked for community services, when I um, worked for docs as a, as a case worker in out-of-home care. Um, and perhaps some of the ideas started before that, but I think there was something that Melissa just said in the presentation she did, um, which sort of acknowledged and identified the people at highest risk of their um, children coming in out-of-home care and, and mothers with a mental health uh, issue. Um, mothers with a charge against their name, or multiple charges often. And part of what the um, research led me to in one, in one moment of what I was doing was to ask, what are the stories that we hold about the people in whose lives we intervene and, and go to court? And if you're a mother with mental health issues, so you've been in hospital, you've had assessments, you've had admissions, your medication, if you had charges, if you might have been in detention, then the story that we can tell about those women is predominantly and largely from documents that are held in places such as those other sectors that are subpoenaed and brought to court and, and put before the magistrate. Um, and so I, I kind of thank you for sort of highlighting that. I think that really kind of identifies that in a really effective way. So there was some practice origin to this work. Um, and if anyone's been through a social work degree or a community welfare and human services degree, you might have spent some time thinking about writing in your professional practice. And I think predominantly we have the habit of talking about that as a technical process. You know, is it accurate? Is it relevant? Is it not interpretive, just the facts? But I don't think we invite our students and our new practitioners to think about the, the power of our writing and the possibilities and the responsibilities uh, in terms of constructing a world through, through stories that we, that we um, create in our, in our writing. Um, and, but I think, think Michael White and David Epstein did um, a fairly good job in the kind of um, narrative means to therapeutic ends of really sort of illustrating what, what papers and what documents 
letters from professionals and a whole range of assessment items, the ways that those construct the people about whom they're written. They're often written to another professional about someone without consideration of that someone they're written about. So some of that kind of followed a narrative turn in anthropology and, um, and ethnography. Um, so I guess I sort of find it useful to uh, think in terms of a narrative paradigm uh, for the way we kind of hold information about and understand our lives, that we sort of story our lives with, with characters and events arranged in order often according to time. And that we do that internally as we tell our own stories to ourselves, we do it culturally and socially. Um, but perhaps we also do that in the documents we uh, create, whether it's a case file note, whether it's the things we submit to court. Narratives are, are created socially in this framework. They're not singular and often uh, multiple. The one, the one moment in time or the one thing about our life can have many different stories, although one may come to dominate, depending on how often it's retold, who else supports it, that sort of idea. And there's some, some authors there who talk about that. So the background to the research had the idea that documents are constituent and active parts of what goes on in a children's court matter, um, although they're not sufficiently considered. And so it sort of borrows from or draws on the idea that documents have a form of agency. Actually what happens in court is not just all about the people there, but the things in that space, including the documents and the paperwork. It borrows from assemblage theory by Bruno Latour, um, which, if you're interested, is, is kind of, you know, I find that really fascinating. Um, and it says that coming together to make the things that we make in a social space is a combination of everything in that space. Uh, we pay attention often most to the people, and we think the people are making things happen. But we could ask how many ways are the arrangement of the chairs, the nature of the technology, the physical space we're in right now, shaping what goes on here in this perhaps what we might call a social moment. And I started with the question based on that stuff, what did child protection court documents do to people who are closely involved with them? There's limited other research in this space. Um, and Katie Prince from 1996 was in the UK working in a um, sort of a non-mandated non um, child welfare service. And she was looking at the documents she was writing and asking and, and had a trial of working and writing documents with the people in her service, not making case notes about them later, but writing those documents together. Last year, um, in some research out of Newcastle, um, there was a small, uh, there was a study of um, parents whose children are removed and placed in out of home care, and in one small section of that, the parents talked about the court documents and how significant those were um, in their experience of the process. There's a lot more work these days into archive research and very recently the, um, the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Assault also contained some material on the documentary evidence that was or wasn't held relating to the children in those institutions and asked about what do we do document, how and why and what difference does it make. So in terms of what I did in this research, I, I did sit down with, um, I did what's called a single unit case study. I took one case, one child protection court matter relating to one child. Um, I sat down with the file in that case and I was able to look at the material that related, that related, related to the person from whom I had consent. I had the dad's consent and therefore I was able to look at the material relating to him and his child, but I didn't look at the material <coughs> relating to his um, ex-partner and the child's mum. I, I didn't have that consent. I, I used a method called qualitative document analysis and I didn't want to ask are these documents accurate? Are they kind of contradictory or anything? I wanted to ask what's the narrative structure of these documents? What is, what is the plot or what are the plots? Who are the characters? What's the context of the story? What's the implied or stated causality here, in sort of, you know, in what ways does it tell a story about this was done because of these things, etc. I was interested in the constructed author 
And, and when we read a story, we might think about, yeah, there's a story here, it, it's a narrative, it's kind of telling about a plot, but there's also an <laughs> author that's embedded in that process. So the person who writes the document is often um, creating and constructing an, a version of themselves. Um, and some research that was done in the UK um, by Fincham et al. looked at um, coronial inquest files into suicide cases and not only the content of those files but also how did the professionals construct their professional self in relation to the assessments they wrote, the reports they provided to the court, did the, how, in what ways did the doctors show, well I did everything I could and still it went down that path. So we're creating versions of ourselves as we construct documents about others. And there's also in this space, and if you've ever written child protection court, a court document, <coughs> there's an assumed reader. We're predominantly assuming we are writing for the magistrate. That's who we're writing to. Um, and I think that, and I was interested in that and how that shaped the document. I was then able to interview five different people who were involved in that one case, in that one matter. So I was interested in what the documents do to the people closely associated with, it, with the case. So I was able to talk to the father, to the, a caseworker who worked on a casework manager, a solicitor and the magistrate who heard the matter. So it was kind of like a bit of a 360 degree view in that way. And I interviewed uh, the people twice each. There's some themes, I was interested in what they remembered about them, what would they say about the process of creating the documents, what difference does it make that the documents were for court rather than a letter or something or a case note, um, what would the participants say about the effects of documents as they experienced them or, have wit um, or other effects they've witnessed, do documents play a role in the regulation of parenting, and are there gendered responses? And those last, that last question particularly came, and, and the reason I did two interviews was that sometimes a little theme would emerge in my first set of interviews, and then I wanted to go back and ask everyone about it more directly and deliberately. And that gendered response was one thing that came up there. Um, so in terms of reading the documents, yes, I, I was kind of really able to see that sense of character development that goes on in that process of creating a court document. Some of it's through the um, mandated documents that are required to initiate a court proceeding. Who's the father? Who's the mother? What are the child's relationships? Where were people from? A whole series of kind of small boxes that you have to fill in, but that actually begins the process of constructing character. There's framing narratives, which are sort of a higher order story such as in this case maybe risk on the basis of drug use and there's a whole series of micro narratives that are incorporated that sort of help to build this kind of larger framing narrative. So the occasion that um, dad was pulled over by the police and was found to have um, drug paraphernalia in the car is kind of a micro narrative that gets fed into this larger framing narrative. Other documents were obviously present and interwoven in these stories and so the subpoenaed material from police, from hospital, uh, or health, um, were present. And I guess in looking at it, I really got to see a, a dominant story, particularly about risk and drug use and unreliability, but also some alternative stories that actually could have been told but weren't. And one of them, I think, um, with the K contact, I think is really interesting, is there were a series of contact reports attached as, as is kind of appropriate. And the contact reports demonstrated, told the story of, they had material that you could say illustrated relationship between dad and, and the child. And so, you know, descriptions, as, and these are kind of like just descriptive um, documents. I'm um, just stating um, the child was at the front door of the contact house, banging on the door and calling daddy as she saw Dad arrive, um, as they parted, um, you know, Dad did his best to settle a child and she left with tears in her eyes. Statements that were just matter of fact, but they sort of had the potential to tell a story, but it wasn't a story that was told. In the interviews, um, there are a few things, I just want to share some material from the interviews. 
People talked about the structures of this context, that this is civil court, it's not criminal. Evidence is in affidavit form. That is, the, that is the way evidence is presented in this space. It's not verbal. Community service documents have the potential to run to 500 pages. An affidavit of 30, 40 pages and an annexed material um, in subpoena that can run to hundreds and hundreds, literally hundreds of pages. Um, and anything that's not disputed is accepted as fact. So what Dad said about some of this is that, you know, I'm just a tradesman, you know. I'm not some lawyer or anything. Um, they said, and he's talking about the community services case workers, this is what we're going to put into court. And I looked at it and they said, you go through it. And I said, but these are wrong. I, I highlighted so much of it. I said, hang on, the judge is going to read this and it's not correct. And the caseworker said, well, look, that's where you've got to get your lawyer. That's what they said to me. You've got to get your lawyer to say that it's not correct. And that's process. Like, I'm, I'm not disputing that that's not procedural um, thing. It's like, this is our evidence that we're going to put to court. You have to pro provide your own evidence and response to it. But that's Dad's experience of that process. I was interested in that question of resources that are available to different people in this space around creating these, these documents. So we have the kind of degree qualified professionals um, and parents might not have completed year nine at school and a whole range of other things that um, you know, um, are aware. Community services has at least three different professionals working on reviewing the materials before going to court, um, including legal review as well as casework manager, etc. Um, the parent might get legal aid representation. In this matter, Dad didn't because he was um, working a bit, working more than, more than, you know, he didn't qualify for legal aid. And there's really clearly, and, and the caseworker the case was really clear about this in the manager, there's an onus on community services to be balanced, to be fair and look for materials that present parents positive as much as risk of harm issues. And I think, yeah, that's great. I think that's a really um, integrated sense of the job for caseworkers. But we might ask, where is that material that tells those other stories? And how easy is it to access those materials? So the solicitor, when I asked him about what sort of resources and what can he do and how much capacity does he have to respond, he said, um, of course not. Our job is to reply to the department's materials. And sometimes we need to reply to a lot of, these, of those things that are attached to the affidavit. We try to address each of these issues that departments raised in their affidavits, but we don't have the luxury. I mean, my average affidavit will be five pages. And so lawyers acting for parents need to develop skills of sorting out what matters and what needs to be answered. And to be able to do that within, we need to be able to do that within you know, about two hours at the most. I would spend two hours preparing an affidavit, that's it. And that's kind of in a, an attempt to respond to up to 500 pages worth of material. The effects of documents, and you may have experienced that, um, you know, perhaps anger, despair, fight, fighting the details, and, and people talked about that can be a real distraction from actually getting on with working out what needs to be done to address the issues, but people get really consumed by fighting the inaccuracies that they experience. So the solicitor said, I had a guy ring me the other day. I had him proceedings here about three years ago and he got on the phone for 25 minutes, so angry. He has his daughter back with him now, but he's so angry. He was talking about the documents. He said, all those things that were in those affidavits, at least half of it were straight out lies or, or just someone's reported something that wasn't true. And he's just so angry. He said, I can't live like this. I said, and the solicitor said, you know, you've got your daughter back. Uh, and he said, but it's eating away at me. The whole thing's eating away at me. And he kept talking about the affidavits. He pulls them out sometimes and looks at them and they make him angry. And that's three years after it's finished. Um, for Dad, and this is really interesting because part of the story that was presented to the court was actually Dad's disengaged from the process. Dad said, but that's why I walked away. I just lost heart. I didn't know how I was going to win this. If I had a great lawyer, I believe I would have. I would have won, probably. But how much money was that going to take? It was hard enough to go to work because I was that depressed. I was just, I was so broken-hearted from it all. To me, it was plain on paper. I couldn't understand why the judge was not reading it. 
But there's also stuff that was going on for the caseworkers, and I, and I really don't want to present a one-sided picture, and it's really important, which is why I've kind of um, read, interviewed lots of people. The caseworker was saying, whenever I hand that first application about why we're removing a child to a parent, I always say to them, this is not going to be easy to read. You're going to read stuff about yourself, and it's never easy to eat, read anything about yourself. It cannot not affect them. If they've already had something happen anyway, an assumption or a removal, they're in the court arena, it's already horrific, but then they're going to read in print. When it's in print and you're reading it, I think it hits harder. So I'm always a little bit trying to prep them. And there was this experience as I went through of the professionals trying to reach out. And often reaching out around the documents, not through them, but around the documents to try to kind of soften the blow. What does this take me to in terms of relevance for the outcomes framework? I think it may have some relevance in the empowerment space, perhaps the social and community space. At an individual level, there might be hope. Uh, uh, sort of the, the literature that's used for the outcomes framework talks about hope, information, skill building, access to help and support. But the outcomes framework doesn't talk about structural change. The outcomes framework talks about individual level change. In this context, maybe the outcomes framework would invite us to think, well, we should encourage parents to stay in school longer and increase their literacy and capacities in that space. Or maybe we should be allocating more legal aid hours. But the outcomes framework doesn't necessarily invite us to, to ask questions like, what's the evidence and what's the procedures and process for evidence and is that process disempowering perhaps? Could we question and think differently about um, the evidence we collect in our practice? Could we be collecting evidence of love, care, responsiveness? Are there spaces within our social and, and social environment, our community, we have a lot of record keeping in other spaces. Can we collect records of love and relationship or responsiveness? As practitioners, can we think about and prioritise the secondary readers of our work? The people about whom we're writing who will also read our documents, even if we don't see them as our primary audience. Um, and and I, I, one of the reasons my, my sort of um, public, you know, finishing this research took a really long time was I was trying to think about how on earth do I write about, research about writing, without writing about the people in ways I'm trying to say we shouldn't write about them. Um, and at one point, and my supervisors kind of just about killed me, very politely though, I thought maybe we could actually do a verbal seminar. Maybe we could not um, document anything. Um, but after their polite kind of encouragement to think again, um, the only way I could come to it was that I, I wrote the thesis to the people I researched with. I wrote to the dad, I wrote to the caseworker, I wrote to the child who I who I imagined might one day read this. So that was the only way I could step around this kind of to try to think about the secondary reader. The primary reader that would still get the same information, they just have to work differently to get it. In terms of policy, can we endorse, support, encourage, make <laughs> space for um, caseworkers reaching out to the people who are the subject of our writing, actually create processes could the children's court review and change evidence practices? Yeah, community services has to present it in um, document form. May parents maybe be able to respond verbally? Um, and I think there's potential for greater research to understand better the links between document practices and meeting a child's best interests. Can that be embedded? I also would like to suggest, and hopefully it's trying to work in the uni space, that we actually change our education practices for new practitioners and maybe for caseworkers um, who are kind of heading into work in this area um, over time. So there, yeah, that's what I would say. Thank you. Thank you.
don't know about you, but I didn't want Chris to stop then. <laughs> um, I was joking before when I said his CV um, shows that he intends to come back and work for facts. Um, but I don't think he should, because I think that is such a good example of when uh, people who are a good practitioners go into research for value they add to the field. It was challenging and it was confronting and um, I'm sure those of us who, who support our uh, frontline practitioners would have felt the same way as me. I, I respect your uh, very careful, generous, respectful language about understanding the process that, you know, uh, sometimes we write things that surprise parents on the day they read their evidence, but it's not good enough. And good practice means that parents should never be surprised by what they read in a court document. And we, we might not always agree, but we should work in partnership to articulate what the problem is. And I've seen countless parents on the uh, other side of good practice who are very open about what their problems are. And what they hate is when their problems are taken out of context or not spoken about truthfully. So just um, such gratitude for you to bring that to life in such powerful research. The, the last thing, uh, Dorothy Scott talks about the word in child protection that is most underused and neglected, and it's the word love. And she says you should talk about it more. So the, the way you brought that into the importance of writing and uh, pushed us to think about that is so fantastic. Thank you.